this is part two of a two-part sermon. Um, for those of you who weren't here two weeks ago, I will do a, a quick review. Um, this all came about when I was listening to, well, I had already had the sermon in mind, but I was listening to YouTube. There's an apologist on YouTube that's very good. I can't remember his name. Cliff something. And he's always on college campuses, and there was a young man saying, how is it that you can say God is fair when he only gives us two choices? We either believe in him or we go to hell. How is that fair? I'm going to tell you, as a 59-year-old aging man, I'm glad I only got two choices. Because to have ten choices would be abundantly confusing. All right. So this sermon is all about the justness of God. And, you know, the title of the sermon is that freedom of choice, truth, and grace are the basis of the justice of God, or the foundations. So let's recap. In the beginning, there was only teen God, full of love, peace, joy, and most importantly, free from sin. Given freedom of choice, first, Lucifer sinned with a third of the angels forming teen Satan. They were marred by sin. Satan and his angels were cast out of heaven to earth. Even though God had given mankind a perfect world and a garden to live in with every and all of our needs met, Satan in the form of a serpent misled mankind using our freedom of choice to sin and join team Satan. We chose the one forbidden food source, only one out of the tens of thousands that God provided. All the trees, all the vegetables, all the fruits, we had to pick one. The attraction of, the, of mankind to sin was the same as Satan's. I bet a lot of people haven't thought about this. Why did Satan sin? He wanted to be more like God. He wanted to be, he wanted to be God. He wanted to have power over the angels. And our sin was no different. Genesis 3, 6. This is what Satan told Eve. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The same thing, the same sin that got Satan got us. Due to our sin, we are separated from God, as God hates sin. In the Bible, he refers to it metaphorically as putrefying sores in Isaiah, a heavy burden in Psalm, defiling filth in Titus and 2 Corinthians, a binding debt in Matthew, darkness in 1 John, and a scarlet stain in Isaiah. But God's will is to reconcile with mankind his hallmark of creation, made in his image. He wants all of mankind, every single one of us, to reconcile with him and rejoin his team, his kingdom. 2 Peter 3.9 says, He does not wish any, not even one, to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Unfortunately, when mankind rebelled against God, we transferred our lease of the world to be under the control of Satan. God had given us a lease. He had made us his caretakers. Subsequently, Satan is referred to as, and this is in the Bible, the ruler of the world, God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, and we are told that the whole world lies in the power of the evil. God is still sovereign. He owns the title deed to the earth, but Satan now has the lease, but not forever. He only has it till Jesus comes back. In God's abundant love for mankind, he gave us his son, Jesus, as the re reconciling sacrifice to redeem mankind to himself, to fix our sin problem. On the cross, Jesus paid the price for our sins, and Jesus is the one and only golden ticket to enable us to enter back into the kingdom of God and to join God's team. This free-to-us ticket is available to everyone. You just have to redeem it. Unlike Willy Wonka, where you had to get the golden ticket, and there was only one. God gives us a golden ticket in every single candy bar. You just have to claim it. <clears throat> At the point that, now that was, the, that was the, the, re the review from last time. Now going on this time. At the point that you believe in Jesus and you accept him as your Lord and Savior, that is, you claim your golden ticket, you are several things. You are saved. Hallelujah. What does it mean to be saved? What are you saved from? You're saved from eternal separation from God based on your sin, and you're also saved from the eternal fire, which was not even prepared for us. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. You are redeemed. 
What does redeemed mean? Redeemed means to gain or regain possession of something in exchange for payment. God paid for you. He paid your sins on that cross. He redeemed you. You were bought with a price. He redeemed you back to team God. You are forgiven. In Ephesians 1 7, we read, In him, we, Christians, believers, have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the richness of his grace. In Psalms 103 12, says, As far as the east is from the west, he removes our transgressions from us. It's like saying infinity to negative infinity. He takes it away. You can't even see it, it's gone. So you're saved, you're redeemed, you're forgiven, and lastly, you're justified. What does justified mean? It means just as if I had not sinned. That's the best way to remember it. Justified. He means to be declared righteous in the sight of God. You are declared righteous in the sight of God because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. God, in the form of Jesus, imputes his righteousness to you. You, you get righteousness imputed to you. Romans 3.22, it says, all, And this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Everyone who believes, that's it. You know, we're still here on earth. We're, we're behind enemy territory. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not our home. Mm -hmm. We are just passing through. But we have a job to do. We're in enemy territory. We've got to do as much good as we possibly can yeah. while we're here and bring as many people with us uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus to, to heaven with him. So the Apostle Paul talks about how we're struggling with flesh and spirit in Romans 8, and uh, verse starting in verse 9, Romans 8, 9 to 11. It says, however you, as a believer in Christ, are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though your body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Now, remember, this sermon's all about God being just, God being fair. And so I'm going to attack it from several different angel, angles. You know, if a person that chooses not to accept this free gift, this free golden ticket, they are making that choice. They are doing it. God's given it to us for free. He's already paid the price, whether you accept it or not. And, and he, he tells us in the Bible, so choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. This is in Deuteronomy. He tells us the name is seek good and not evil so that you may live. He tells us in John 3, 18, this is Jesus speaking. He who believes in him, talking about Jesus, is not judged. But he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. The Bible makes it so abundantly clear that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no ambiguity around it. I mean, God is fair. I mean, it's like hitting you over the head with a hammer and you can't miss what he's telling you. It, it, there's just no confusion. God provides all the data and all the information we need in his creation, in our consciousness, and in his word for us to make an informed decision as to his existence. If he didn't, he would be unjust. And he gives us the offer of forgiveness and reconciliation. Romans 1, verses 18 to 20 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteous, unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. So God starts with saying, You have no excuse. Romans 1 is about people having no excuse. God puts you in a world that gives a testimony to God. It says, first, he says, because that which is known of God is evident within them, you have a conscience. God has given you a conscience and given you a desire to know that there is something bigger and to seek something. Continuing on, he said, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have clearly been perceived being understood by what has been made so that they are without excuse. I can't see anyone looking out at the world and saying they don't see an intelligent design. It would be like a fool looking at an airplane and say, that just happened into existence. It's just had this big metal thing flying around just somehow happened. I mean, look at the trees. I mean, God was talking about trees, this one created after its kind, after its kind. He's got a mold, yes. 
you know, people say, well, we came from monkeys. This no God took out a mold. And, and he said, okay, some things are going to walk on two legs and some things are going to walk on four. So he happened to put monkeys in the category of two legs. That doesn't mean we came from them. That just means we have a similarity to them and that we, have, we walk on two legs. That's all it means. <clears throat> so um, he provides all the information we need in creation. So nobody, the Bible says, nobody is without excuse. So I've heard people say, what if nobody hears the gospel? God says they're without excuse. The world is his testimony. The creation is his testimony. The conscience you have in you. But he also gave us the word of God. He gave us the Bible. Best-selling book in the world. Sold many co more copies than any other book ever. The most read book in the world. The Bible. So God has given us, like I said, a conscience. He's given us an ordered, intelligent, designed world to live in. So even if somebody never hears the gospel, they're without excuse. However, God, in all of his abundant justness and love, says that he will not return for the final judgment until the good news, the gospel, is, has reached the entire world. Matthew 24, 14 said, this is Jesus speaking, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. People are talking about when the end's coming. We're getting, we're getting really close to making sure everybody in the world's heard the gospel. But that's another thing you can check off there. It's like, its return is imminent. <clears throat> Now, there's a set of verses, again, I'm switching, pivoting from a different angle. There's a set of verses that I think can be misread. <clears throat> and unfortunately, I think they're misread and, and misclaimed by Christians. And in misclaiming it, sometimes we mislead people that God is unjust. You'll see what I'm saying. And these are two verses that we, we use all the time. Matter of fact, I've even heard one of them <clears throat> half, half quoted this morning. Romans 8, 28, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I've heard people say on TV or YouTube, say, I've heard it, you know, I love God. I'm called to according to his purpose. I'm a Christian or I was a Christian. Why did this bad thing happen to me? Why did this bad thing happen to me? You know, if I claim in that verse. It says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him. I'm, I love him. The problem is, is a confusion over reading of this word in that the choice of word is those. That's the problem. People think they want to misread the verse. They want to read the verse, misread it this way. And we know that God always causes all things to work together for good to each one who loves God and to each one who is called according to his purpose. But that's not what the verse says. The word those is plural. It's not singular. It's a de demonstrative pronoun. It's plural. So if you think about it, what are some of the substitutions for the phrase, those who love God in that verse? Those who love God. Who, who are those who love God? Any names or ideas come to anybody? And about the church? Those that love God? I, I hope that people would describe the church as those who love God. So it's, it's disciples, his saints, the kingdom of God, if you remember the kingdom of God. So... Now read the verse with those plugged in there instead of those. And you get something like this. You get, and we know that God causes all things to work together for, God, for his church who love God, to, to his church who are called according to his purpose. See, this verse is a plural verse. And what God is saying is, whatever God's will is, whatever he's working in people's life, good or bad, whatever he's allowing in this world, he's working it for the good of his kingdom. He's working it for the good of the church. He's working it for the good of us collectively, not individuals. So be careful how you claim that verse. <clears throat> it's a very, very powerful verse to claim. But just be careful and don't use it as an excuse to say God's not fair. He's not giving me something. I'm, I don't have this. I don't have that. Uh, another verse that we have to be careful how we interpret, and this kind of goes back to you know, Greek being the language that the New Testament's written in, is Philippians. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Philippians 4.13. And I've heard this quoted in this church too. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him. This is a, <clears throat> it's a very misleading when read in English, especially if it's taken out of context. When you take a verse out of context, you have to be very careful. So I'm going to read it to you in the context in which it is, and then I'm also going to give you the literal translation from Greek to English. So the context is read Philippians 4, 11. Not that I speak from need, 
For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. That's the key verse right there to put it in context. I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with a little. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having an abundance and suffering need. Then in the verse, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The literal translation, Young's literal translation says, for all things I have strength in Christ strengthening me. That's what it means. <clears throat> it means no matter what God is bringing you to, God will bring you through it. That's what that verse, that verse means. He will give you strength to endure it. It doesn't mean I can do all things. I can't go fly an airplane. You don't want Paul flying an airplane from here, to, from here to Chicago. You don't. Okay, But I can do all things that God brings me to. He's not going to bring me to fly an airplane. He's not going to ask me to do that. He may ask me to stand up in this pulpit. He's given me strength to do so. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. <clears throat> so just remember, in whatever circumstance you, you find yourself in, God will give you the strength if you put your trust in him to bring you through it. These two verses, when you read them correctly, that God works all things to the benefit of his church and that God will give you the power to come through any circumstance, kind of folds in beautifully with another verse I'll read to you. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he has said to me that my grace is sufficient for you, for power is my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. The world tells us we have to be strong. You're a man. Don't cry. Right? How many times have men heard that? You stump your little toe and see what happens. It don't take much to make a man cry. But we were told all kinds of lies. you gotta, you got to be strong. you got to make a lot of money. You, you won't be anybody if you don't make money. You won't have any influence over people. That's not true. God says that his power is made perfect in our weakness. We need to give it to him. We need to quit thinking we've got the power to control everything because we do not. God is in control. Okay. He is sovereign. As humans, one of the truths about us is that we learn to grow more mature, wise, and resilient by experiencing adversity. The old proverb says, necessity is the mother of invention. <clears throat> Albert Einstein turned that around a little bit. Albert Einstein famously said, adversity is the mother of invention. He says, out of clutter, find simplicity. From discord, find harmony. In the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. I think Albert Einstein was on a, to a biblical concept. Yeah. We talk about learning from our mistakes or learning valuable life lessons. The Bible often provides the metaphor of our growing and our learning as Christians based on the phrase being refined by fire. That comes from, if you think of gold or silver or anything, any kind of impure metal, before it becomes pure, you have to put it through the fire and get the dross to come to the top and clean, clean it off. you got to get the gunk out. And that's what God does to us by putting us through adversity. It's as if we're, he's putting us through a fire. If we look at a couple of verses that talk about that, there's at least three that give us a baseline for understanding why God might put us through adversity, or at least give us the context to handle being put through adversity. Romans 8.18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed to us when Jesus returns. If you're hurting, whatever it is, it's a momentary affliction, I promise you. It is not even compared, cannot be compared to the glory that will be revealed to you in Jesus Christ at his second coming when you spend the rest of eternity in heaven. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For momentary light affliction is producing... For us, an eternal weight of glory far beyond comparison. 1 Peter 5.10 After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect you, confirm you, strengthen, and establish you. So we have these promises. And anytime we're going through trials or tribulations or we're having a little bit of a hard time, we need to grab onto those verses and hold on to them and say, God, I'm, count I'm counting them. I'm counting them. The other thing to realize when it comes to God's fairness is that temptation is not from God. We are all tempted, but temptation is not from God. James says, let no one say when he is tempted that I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. 
But each one of us is tempted when we are carried away and enticed by our own lusts. It's our flesh. It's living in a fallen world. It's the sin of this world where temptation comes from. Temptation does not come from God. For even Jesus was tempted. Matthew 4 says, When Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, he was tempted by the devil. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one, being Jesus, who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus went through the same temptations we do. And there's another verse that I didn't quote, but it says, There's no temptation come to us that's, that hasn't been experienced by mankind from eternity. There's nothing new. The, the devil uses the same old tricks and, and traits. But God will always provide an out for temptations. This is another thing about fairness with God. He says he will always give you an out. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. I'm going to add in there a little, adding, with the strength that he's given you. Remember that verse. You've got to bring the whole Bible together, read it all together. But with the temptation, he will provide the way of escape also that you will be able to endure it. God wants all of his people on Team, team Satan to come to repentance and believe in Jesus. That's his desire. While God does not tempt us, he does test us. I'll come into this in a different name. He does test us. Test us is going through trials and coming out the other side, hopefully stronger, wiser, and more ready to take on the world. Humans are wired to learn from our mistakes and to grow from our tests. God is essentially preparing us, growing us, strengthening our spirits through our trials, just like gold is purified from the refining process. 1 Peter 6 and 7 says, In this you greatly rejoice, for even though for a little while, if necessary, you are being distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which perishes, though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor of the revelation of Jesus Christ. 2 Peter also says, Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from a trial and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. James' first chapter says, Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So not only does he go, let us go through trials, God applies corrections to our lives, like a loving father. Proverbs says, My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord, or loathe his rebuke. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, just as a father disciplines the son in whom he delights. Blessed is a person who finds wisdom and who obtains understanding. Hebrews 12, 6 says, For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Think about a child who just continuously ran into the road. And if, and if a parent just didn't need to correct them, just let them keep doing it. But probably won't end all eventually sometime in their life. Discipline is necessary for us to learn. We don't, we don't learn any other way from our mistakes. Matter of fact, if God supplied our every need, if he gave us everything in life so that we didn't have to strive for anything, if he gave us no trials, then we are very likely to become conceited and realize we don't need him. Revelation 3, 17 through 19 says, Because you say, I am rich, and I have become wealthy, and I have no need of anything, and you do not know that you are, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, and white garments so that you may be clothed yourself, and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and the eye salve to apply to your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Those, therefore, be zealous and repent. <clears throat> God loves us, so he corrects us sometimes. So God provides trials and gives us strength to endure so that we will repent and turn to him for our support and guidance. But why does God allow bad people or bad people sin to hurt others? First, as I talked about last sermon quite a bit, God has given us freedom of choice. God can't, God won't override our freedom of choice. He won't. That's something he's given to us as a gift. And, that, and, and people use that to choose good, and some people use it to choose evil. He would be infringing on our God-given freedom if he were to take that away from us. <clears throat> but the, God, the Bible indicates another reason disclosed by Jesus telling 
a, par a parable. So listen to this parable. It's a little long, but listen to the, the punchline. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, while the farmer was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and left. And when the wheat sprouted and produced grain, then the weeds also became evident. And the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have wheat? You can stop right there. And say, that, that tells you God didn't put the evil in the world. It came from somewhere else. It came from Satan. So all the bad things in this world are not from God because it says all good things come down from the Father of lights. Everything that's good comes down from God. Amen. And he said to them, an enemy has done this. The slave said to him, well, do you want us to go out and to gather them up, gather up the weeds? <clears throat> and listen to this. But he said, no, that while you are gathering up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. God will not even take a chance on tearing down one of his Christian believers, one of those people, by tearing up the bad people. By ripping them out, he may have adverse effects on the Christians around them. And <clears throat> Brother Aaron, I wish he were here today, he talked about how, and I don't remember, Dina, what was the guy's name he was talking about that was the one cursing at uh, King David as he left? Do you remember? Yeah, that was... I'm so sorry. That's okay. If you were here, there was a man who was cursing at King David as he was getting run out of, the, run out of town by his son Absalom. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the king's bodyguard basically said, you want me to go over and kill him? I can't stand this. I've got to go kill that man. And David said, no, let him be. Let him be. Leave him alone. Then when, when, then when David came back into claiming the kingdom, because Absalom had been killed, the same man came up to him and said, please don't kill me. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to King David. I didn't mean to say all those bad things. And his, and his sword bearer said, you want me to kill him now? Because he deserves He's even admitting it. He said, David said, no, no. No, no, let him, let him, let him be. It's fine. God, God's brought me back. And then we found out that this guy that was spared was the grandfather of. I gotta get this person. My, I, I should have studied this. Eric, tell Aaron I'm embarrassed. I'm sorry about the names. But was the grandfather of the female in the book of what is it? Esther. It was Esther's great grandpa or grandpa. That's right. That's right. It was in her direct line. And Esther saved the entire Jewish community and this entire, entire Jewish, Jewish thing under the control of Babylon at the time. So if King David had killed her grandfather, she might not have existed at that point, however many years later, to save the entire Jewish thing. We don't know what God's doing. Okay? We don't know his mom. His ways are higher than our ways. We just have to take and, and, and go with the flow and take the strength he's given us and do the best we can to make it through, remembering that this light infliction we're having is nothing compared to what he's going to give us when we get there. So why does God allow bad things to happen? I'm going to give you a few reasons why I think he may. Um, but before I do that, I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you something I've learned as a Christian. And, and asking why on this side of the veil is futile. That's what I've learned for myself. Because the answer is not going to come. <laughs> There's only one person that can tell you why God's doing something, and that's God. And if you want to know, then put your faith in Jesus and make it to heaven, then you can ask him. And I'm sure he'll have a reason that makes complete sense to you. He has a reason for these things. He's not doing it to punish us. But anyway, why does God allow bad things to happen? Number one, he does it to honor our free will. That's what came from the first sermon. God allows people to perform bad actions. As he gave them free will, however, everyone's actions will be called into remembrance at the final judgment and the rewards or punishment given. They won't escape from those. The people that are treating people poorly and are, are sinning horribly, Hitler, for example, he's not going to escape his punishment unless for some miracle he made a confession on his deathbed and truly turned to Christ, which I doubt he did based on his sin. But he will get his payment. God works all things to the king, good of his kingdom. That can have all kinds of implications. I just gave you the example with David sparing someone who deserved death. He, was, he could have been easily killed and no one would say anything to David. He deserved to die because of what he was saying to the king. But David sparing him, two, three generations later, gave the Jewish people their salvation. <clears throat> so God works all things to the good of his kingdom. We don't know what that is. His, his ways are bigger than ours. 
God allows us to go through trials so that we remain humble and learn to trust Him and not on ourselves. To help us grow spiritually or be even refined by the fire. And to demonstrate His great mercy and His great love so that when he, that we do make mistakes, He'll forgive us. Sometimes we just got to make them so He can forgive us. God applies correction. Is there another reason why God made why bad things to happen? He's applying correction as a loving Father so that when we start to stray, we commit sin, He brings us back because He loves us. We as part of mankind have to take some responsibility. And I'm almost done. There's only two more things. We as mankind have to take some responsibility of the bad things. God put a curse on the earth. That was Adam's punishment from his sin. He said, you will, he didn't say you might, you will labor and toil to get the, to get the vegetation to grow now and to get your food. Satan comes along and says, nah, he ain't got to listen to him. You know what he's talking about. Here, take this pesticide and spray it all over everything you eat. Take this insecticide and spray it all over everything. Take this you know, fumigation and spray it on everything. It kills all the bugs. You won't have to go out there. Everything really will be great. I ain't going to tell you that generations later, people are going to start dying from cancer, birth defects, and all these other things. And why did we listen to that? Because it made our life easy. It's all about money. <laughs> Instead of having to pay people to come through there and pick bugs off and pick up things. That's right. And we just go, easy, easy. Spray some spray there. It's gone. Yeah, that's a miracle. That must be from God. No, it's not. No, that's right. That ain't from him. And so we did that. We let the devil convince us that that was good. Plastics. That's right. We had glass. Mm -hmm. We had ceramics. You know why they want plastics? They don't break. Mm -hmm. They're lighter. It's cheaper to transport. Less waste from, from breaking things. We didn't need plastics. Every plastic that's ever been created is still on Earth and will be here for, for hundreds of thousands of years. If you want to think about who did the, the, the bad things to bad people, it's mostly us. We did it to ourselves. You know, and by God's grace, He will save us. He will save us. Some blame God for their or other people's actions the bottom line is, dark, bad things come from sin. Mm -hmm. The Bible says all good things come from the Father of lights. That's right. And I can guarantee you all bad things or evil things come from Satan. There's only two, two teams, remember. You're either on Team God or Team Satan. You want to be on Team right. God. Right. So give God the glory. Let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we, we turn to you as our salvation. We ask you for forgiveness, redemption, salvation. We ask you for all of these things. We are not worthy. We know we are not worthy. We have sinned against you many times purposefully, sometimes out of ignorance. But regardless, we know we are not worthy of your love. But you, in your abundant love, in your abundant justice, in your abundant fairness, you sent your one and only son to live among us, to live as a human, tempted as we are, but without sin and to give his life on that cross as a payment for our penalty, for our lives, our penalty, for the way that we live, for the sins that we do. You sent your son. But while we were yet sinners, you loved us so much that you sent your son. And we just thank you for that. And we put our trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God incarnate. And we know that it's only by his grace and only by your grace, Father, that we will come into heaven because you assigned his righteousness to us. And we know we still don't deserve it, but you love us so much you do it anyway. And Lord, we thank you for this gift, and we just ask that you would be with the world. Help those that are blinded by Satan and blinded by hate and lust and greed to turn, to go into situations where you show them. Bring them to the bottom, if that's what it takes. Whatever it takes, bring them to the bottom so that they will turn to you and bring them into heaven so that all may be saved, which is, in, which is your will. We just thank you for your, your grace and abundance on us today, and thank you for allowing us to worship you today, here and today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much, Lord, for your holy.